meeting to order. It is um, 7.01. We could please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, I pledge allegiance to the, to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Um, so tonight we continue our discussion of the superintendent's proposed 2020-2021 budget. Um, we are picking up, I think, on question 23 or thereabouts. Um, I'll, let, I'll, I'll hand it over to you, Dr. Tatiya, to start where you feel you would We're like actually going to go out of order a little bit. Okay. Because um, we want to close out last night, if that's mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. And uh, so we have some follow-up answers starting with 40. But um, I also have... Um, a clarification and an expansion of an answer I gave last night that I felt like needed to be revisiting. So, uh, Mr. DeYoung, you asked uh, something about library media uh, centers and specialists and how that would be distributed uh, yeah. next year. Uh, and that potentially um, sharing of specialists across the elementary schools. So, um, a little bit more information. Art, music, PE um, are allocated historically based on number of sections and enrollment of schools, uh, students. So that number fluctuates potentially year to year. Um, so it can be uh, anywhere you know, different, 0 0.75, 0 0.8, 1.0, 1 1.2. So depending on the number of sections that have to be covered, art, music, PE get allocated that way. Historically, library media does not. Okay. Historically, library media gets um, Seven elementary schools have 1.0 and Pumpkin has 0.8. What we'll be doing uh, is likely allocating FTE in the library media uh, department based on sections and enrollment like the other three specials for next year. Um, I will tell you, just to forecast for you, in a, I predict in a four or five year period, part of the vision is to shift more to a learning commons at the elementary library uh, level. So we're starting with the teaching and learning commons at the high schools, right? And then we'll move our way to the middle schools, transform those, and then get to the elementary schools. At that time, I'll likely come back to you with a package uh, proposal. Moving to a learning commons is a very different um, approach and instructional model to a library than what we're accustomed to. It, um, it's less structured and schedule. It's much more collaborative. We have some collaboration now, but it extends it. And it becomes sort of like the science lab model we explained last night, where there are longer units, deeper study, collaboration, particularly around the ISTE standards, as related to the content areas in the classrooms. So while some of that is occurring now, our the way we schedule library uh, as, a, um, as a special limits us from being able to do that. So while we will look for um, efficiencies and FTEs th the next year, I believe that in a few years we'll come back and provide a package saying, hey, this is the new Learning Commons vision and likely rolling those FTEs back up. But for now, until we can get to that work, I believe allocating library like we do art, music, PE is what we have planned for the 19, nope, 2021 <laughs> school year. So okay. I just wanted to expand on why that whole sharing thing may occur. All right. Okay? I appreciate that. Thank you. All right. So starting with uh, question 40. Uh, we have provided with you in this packet an overview of NGSS standards. And um, there is a link where you can access the 102 pages of the standards <laughs> if you'd like some deeper reading this weekend. Um, 41, we also have attached the media aid job description to your packet. We were asked for statistics on the number of families that access the summer um, library at Meadowside and Pumpkin Delight. You will see data there made available to you for Meadowside first and then Pumpkin. So it looked like uh, averaging between 30 and 40 families accessing it throughout the summer. You'll see that um, both were open for four days throughout the summer, staffed with library and literacy people, facilitating um, literacy-based activities as related to the summer reading program from the library. Do you want me to pause in case no, there are additional yeah, I questions? Question. I have a question on this. So 
It says we did have a waiting list and a lot of additional interest. Students had, okay, students had to sign up. Um, so it's not like just a library's open, come on in. It's so at Meadow, I think it was based on how much staff was available mm -hmm. to work with children. So you don't want a 40 to 1 ratio, mm -hmm. parents dropping off, and now we have a safe. So um, with this plan, what we'll do with the Meadowside, Pumpkin, and JFK, we'll come back to uh, working with Dr. Fedigan, our instructional supervisor, uh, Ms. Morrow, which spoke last night, to develop a plan to ensure that we have the right amount of staff, the common activities across the three that are literacy based so we can accommodate as many students as we can. Okay. Okay. Um, 43. We did not collect data uh, for the summer 2019, but that is something that we could plan to do in 2020. Uh, and on 44, Please know that we really got up and running mid-October with our um, CCC at Pumpkin. And from mid-October to present, we believe, uh, based on our data collected, we've served 21 families directly. So not a bad return in a short period of time. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Dr. Kudai, can I? Um, that the Community Connection Center, I think you answered this last night, but that's going to be open to anyone? that or just pumpkin families and just the So we're starting at pumpkin yeah. um, because the individual is new, creating relationships, right. establishing the program and herself. Mm -hmm. So the vision is to um, provide larger services to west side of town, hence a second for east side of town. So it's it's going to be like the ripple, you know, yeah. you throw the rock into the pond, hopefully. Okay. Row. All right. Thanks. And there were questions about uh, pre-K to three uh, world language. So uh, in preschool, while there are a smaller number of classes, um, I will ask you to not think of it as number of classes, but number of sections, because there are half-day programs. We want to offer both sections access to world language instruction. So based on our calculations in pre-K, as you see there, there are actually 19 sections to, of students to instruct. In kindergarten, we predict 23. 23 in first grade, 22 in second, 21 in third for the coming year. So um, while there's number, those based on those numbers, if we wanted to add grade three programming for world language next year, it would require an addition of 0.8 FTE to get to the 21 sections, which would be about a $52,000 cost. And please remember, we would have to purchase some supplies and materials for those classes and accelerate the development of curriculum for grade three. So I know that uh, that was being discussed last night. So that's some information for you. Okay. Can, Mr. Could, you, could you make the, I know you can't make an exact comparison between third, fourth, and fifth, but could you, would it be roughly the same cost, do you think, at, to ex expand to fourth and fifth, or is it? No, because I think in third grade we'll continue the 20 minutes okay. of instruction. We still need some time to think about fourth and fifth grade. Do we do we roll that up to 30 or 45? And so um, I don't know that we've had enough planning time on that. Okay. And and we really want to see how you know K1 is going and yeah, sure. how much that is sticking with kids. Right. Uh, okay. So potentially, if we roll up the minutes of instruction, that will cost more because we'll need more teachers. Right. Okay. All right. Thanks. Any other questions on these points this far? Great. Okay. Can we roll back to 23 now? Yes. Okay. I'll take 23. Can I ask you a quick question, Mr. Richitelli? So we have an additional, you gave us another packet that starts with 23. Are, is, are all the answers the same as what we were given yesterday? Yes. Just, okay. It, yep. These just have more questions based on what right. you I, I wasn't sure yeah. if okay. I needed to throw out what I had yesterday or if I No, no okay. the, the, from 23 on is the same, plus we added questions that came in today. Okay, thank you. Sure. Okay, so number 23 um, asks the question about um, the solar projects. Um, how many buildings are online, um, and what's the savings that's been realized <coughs> to, the, to date? So um, all of the schools that are going online are online. Uh, Harborside Middle School, we are not doing, that's the only school that we are not doing solar on. And the reason for that is there, uh, the city is planning a microgrid between Harborside, City Hall, Parsons, 
the senior center, I believe the library. So, um, so it didn't make sense to put solar on the roof because the microgrid is going to take place. I don't understand all of that, but the numbers didn't work for uh, but, but anyway, um, all of the other schools um, are online. They came on at varying times throughout the year. Um, East Shore was the first one that came on uh, at, in November of 2018. And the last one which came on, was, which was West Shore Middle School, just came on in uh, January, just this month. So um, they've, been, they've come in at varying times. We're collecting data. Um, it's very difficult because the, the, um, what, what, what affects how much savings is in the, uh, the generation of the electricity. But with generation, there's also the, um, the um, I, I get this mixed up all the time, the delivery charges which come from UI. So we now have three suppliers for electricity in every one of our buildings. Our, um, we have uh, Constellation, we have Skyview, who's the solar, and we also have UI. And so trying to um, read the bills and make sense of the bills, what I can tell you is that we are generating savings. Um, what I can't tell you is pinpointed exactly. We believe that in the end, it will be about five to 6% that we will save on our electric costs. Um, but if you look in, in your budget book on Roman numeral 11, uh, last year we anticipated a, um, or, or the current year that we're in, uh, we actually cut the budget by about 10%. Uh, we believe that we're going to be close to that, but we don't know if we're going to achieve that this year. Um, and so we, we cut it a little bit less this year, and, and the average we're hoping for is about 5 to 6 percent savings. Uh, but it's going on the downside. Um, and, and once we have a full year, full cycle of all of our schools on the solar projects, we'll be able to report to you with more specificity. Uh, but they're all up and running now. Um, we believe that we're the only school system in Connecticut that has gone completely solar, with the with the exception of Harborside, um, and um, so it's it's great for it's it's great for Milford. It puts us on the map as far as uh, being green and uh, looking for alternative energy. Questions? So I imagine uh, the the fact that energy rates still do go up is <coughs> complicates matters as well in trying to figure out. Correct. Oh. It does. Do you yeah. look more at um, like the kilowatt hours used versus the actual cost, or <laughs> no? The, the way the way that our program works is the uh, Skyview leases the roofs, the rooftops. They so they own all the equipment, um, and then we whatever whatever electricity is generated from the solar, we purchase that electricity okay. from them mm -hmm. at a reduced rate, and it's approximately. Um, one penny per kilowatt hour, but that varies, um, and then you have to, and, and that's only on a portion of the bill. Right. Then you have to add back in all the tariffs and the surcharges okay. and right. the taxes and everything else. So Say no more. <laughs> bills are extremely complicated. Okay, thank you very much. Any other questions on this, uh, Ms. Petrosky? Are there any cases where there's actually excess electricity generated? No, we don't want to do that. Okay. Um, we, we made sure that when we sized mm -hmm. the, um, the projects, we made sure that we wouldn't go over it because then we pay a penalty to UI and to our provider, which is Constellation. Okay. So, so we don't want to go over it. <coughs> okay. Thank you. Ready to move on? Okay. okay. All right. The second one, um, the account 4104, Energy Conservation okay. Services. Why is this account zeroed out? And um, that's the account that uh, we used to pay the Synergistics program, which was an energy conservation program. And we actually paid for a service out of the savings that we generated. Um, but when that contract ended, um, the board saw fit to continue to, to give the district money to use for um, energy conservation infrastructure. Um, we're looking for incentives to the utilities and things like that. The bottom line here is we um, we completed the solar. Uh, we are with money that the board has previously funded. Uh, we're working on LED projects, and we just thought that this was a year, especially when we were looking for 
other savings in the budget. Uh, but this was the year to kind of put the brakes on, uh, take a breath, and, um, and you know, and then and then assess where we are uh, with the projects that we already have in the works. Questions? Okay. Okay, 4305 grounds projects, what's driving the proposed increase at the elementary and high school levels? First of all, I would, I would, I would caution, well, let me, let me back up first of all. There's a listing of all of the buildings and grounds projects in your package. So you can actually see what we're proposing to, uh, what projects we're proposing to, um, to tackle with the budget that we put forth. Um, but I think it's important for the board to understand that although there's, although there's an increase this year in um, what we're asking for in the building projects line, um, this is a very small percentage of all of the projects that we have on our priority list in, in the district. So when the requests came in, they were far in excess of $4 million. And as you can see, we pared it down to about $800,000. So we're, we're, we are. Oh, 820. 820. I'm sorry. I mean, Thank sorry. you. Yeah. Yeah, eight, on 820 is the building projects, and on 21 is the ground projects. So um, I would just I would say yes, it's an increase this year. Um, but in the overall scheme of things, we, we, we barely touch the projects that are on our list of things that need to be accomplished. Um, and that's just, that's the nature of buildings and grounds projects. They, they, they go on the list um, and, um, you know, they, we, we prioritize them. Uh, Pat Bradbury meets with the building administrators and they prioritize the projects and um, uh, probably about 10% uh, of the projects that uh, are on that list actually make it to the budget. So, I can answer any questions. Mr. Pulaski. Thank you. Uh, traditionally, at toward the end of the fiscal year, um, anything that seems to be left over, left over, yeah. gets transferred over to the grounds projects to kind of eliminate some of those and take care of those before the fiscal year is out. Do you anticipate that happening in our current fiscal year? If if there is money at the end of the year, which we anticipate, we will we, we will um, end the year in the black. So we do anticipate anticipate a surplus. We're not in a position at this point to say how much that would be, um, but yes, we would we would come to the board again and um, tell you the projects that are on our list and um, propose that we use that money for and and any end of the year savings for buildings and grounds projects. As has been, tr and, and traditionally this board has been very supportive of that practice. And would those, if, if we met that scenario, would these be the projects that would be targeted with the uh, excess? No, these projects are, these projects, well, assuming that you pass the budget at these levels, these projects would be in the budget and would be solid. Um, anything, um, if there were end of year money, it would be projects that didn't make it to this list that are next on our priority list. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. And the, um, can you speak, just refresh our memories, there's the replacing the playscape at Live Oaks, which is a considerable expense, $125,000. That's related to the parking lot issue, correct? Or to the parking issue? Yes and no. Um, it's, it's in the parking area and we want to get it out of there. It, we really could leave it there, even with the with the uh, planned improvements, uh, but it doesn't make sense to have it there, mm -hmm. and it right. needs to be replaced anyway. Okay. And that playscape is right on the road. Right. Mm -hmm. Correct. We'd, we'd prefer that not to be there, and, and put it, it back with the other play mm -hmm. area. And it's old. Old. And correct. it's old. It's, it's over old. twenty years old. Okay. Yeah. All right. Any other, Mr. Dion? I just wanted to follow up on the playscape. So we replaced two this past year. Is that right? We did. Yeah, and then so we're, we'll be replacing the Live Oaks one this year, assuming the budget passes. Correct. Is the anticipation that we'll do like one or two every year for the next few years? Yes. Okay. All right. Thanks. Other questions from board members? Okay, thank you. Uh, let's see. Explain the reason for differences in allocations within levels. So. I question the board. I, I think we're talking about well, what, yes, we are page 29. Uh, um, uh, I, I question 
the board to make comparisons between the, the 6100, especially the 6100 and 6110 accounts, because as we talked about last night, these are the accounts that uh, the, the individual principals have some discretion over. And so where you see a fluctuation from school to school, that represents the principal's priorities for that particular year. So um, if, I'm just using, I didn't even look at the page, but if library books, um, if this year Foreign was buying $5,000 worth of library books and Law was buying 10, it may have been reversed the previous year. They may just not be on the same cycle. So al although it looks like um, there's, there's uh, discrepancies from school to school, you really can't make that comparison because it, again, it represents the principal's priorities um, and the needs of the school for that particular year, which may be different from another school at the same level. So page 29 does not represent allocation. It represents how administrators have chosen to spend parts of their allocations based on priorities, as Jim said. So, but all of the elementary schools are on the 6100 have only have $200 allocated in 1920, which seems odd if it's per, if it's a principal's discretion, they all ask for the same things. I find these accounts are very confusing for my, myself. So, and and then in 20, in the in the proposed budget, we have one that they didn't ask for anything in this area and. Which one? Well, like Cap Penn has money allocated. Yeah. They, they, they would have put their money. So they would have put their money somewhere else. Is correct. Right? Okay. Yeah. All right. It's this, remember the, that per pupil allocation. It's, it's a dispersed. very broad. Right. Yeah. And it's, it's very broad. Amongst the six thousands. Right. Okay. In six thousands in eight one hundred. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> I think I ask that question every year. I ask that question. <laughs> <laughs> Mm -hmm. Okay, question 27 is around um, testing and assessments. How did the removal of NWEA testing affect this account? Mm -hmm. And do we anticipate additional decreases in the account? So the NWEA computer software program, uh, assessment program, including computer software, was paid out of account 6902. And we did realize a savings of $67,000. Um, and we will no longer be using the NWA, so we have not budgeted for it moving forward beyond this budget. Any other questions on that? Any other questions on this? Okay. Yes, Mr. Pulowski. Can we go back to one question for a second? Can, let's be sure nobody has questions on this one first. 27. Are we all set on 27? Okay, Mr. Kalowski, you want to go back to 26? Is that what you're asking yes. to do? Yes. Just, back to 26? Just real quick. Um, the 6110 um, instructional supplies, I just, um, I, I, I feel like it's in here somewhere, um, but there's a line that says all schools, is, we have a figure there, and then we have the total, um, but there's, there's no line item specifically for what makes up the remainder of that. There's, there's the jump from all schools to total. That's the total of all the numbers added up above it. Oh, that's that's everything there. Mm -hmm. Nine hundred nineteen nine six five is the total of I all of the individual. I thought all schools. Okay, all schools is a separate line. I'm not not all those added up. Right. Cool. Thank you. So that should yes. oh, right. also okay. mean that district wide. All, yeah. yes. all okay. schools. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I thought that was the, that. the addition yeah. of all of those, and then I was oh. like, well, what happened there? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Okay. Can I have more on that? <laughs> We're on uh, number 28, uh, 73, the 73K account. Um, what's the driver for nearly $100,000 increase in this account? And I would direct your attention to Appendix J on page A22 and 23. Um, that's a complete list of everything that we purchased. But you know, if you had to pick out two of the major drivers for the hundred thousand dollar increase, um, it would be the elementary science labs at twenty three seven eight four, and the um, foreign and East Shore fitness rooms, which combined for a total of ninety three thousand dollars. But but the whole list is there for you to see. Um, 
um, what's, what's driving the increase. Is that clear? Mr. DeYoung. I just had a question on the ViewSonic boards. Um, uh, what's the easiest way to show it? Oh, so like number 113 is 2848. This is on Appendix 22. <clears throat> and then 112 is 3698. Is that because the ones that are coming on the cart are more expensive? Yep. And the one in the science labs will be on the wall? Okay. Other questions? Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, number 29, furniture and fixtures. Um, how many spaces do, you, do we anticipate that we'll be able to furnish um, with the increased line item? And um, it's, we are, in, in that particular line item, it's uh, 24 kindergarten classrooms um, and a start on the foreign learning comedy. As Dr. Kataya said, the learning comments at Florida will probably be phased in over time. Any questions? Do you have the furniture picked? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Do you have the furniture picked out for the kindergartens yet? Or? I have some slides to show you with the next question. Okay, perfect. Thank you. you ready to move on? Okay. Yep. So number 30, what's the timeline? Um, so with the arrival of the middle school uh, furniture, we have two in each middle school. Uh, we really want to quote unquote test out the furniture uh, and let our students and staff really um, identify for us what's working and we're also finding that that potentially could be level based and content area based. Those of you who took the tour, uh, you saw an ELA class versus a math class, both teachers felt that the same furniture would not work for those content areas, that there would have to be a, a, a difference. Um, the learning commons at law is teaching us a lot of things. Um, there are a couple pieces which I'll show you that are um, much more effective and popular with some of the teachers and, and students. And we want to um, try out some kindergarten furniture. So timeline is a difficult um, question to answer, but we're hoping that with those pieces in, uh, in play, the middle school furniture here, testing things out at law, bringing in some furniture in kindergarten, that about a year from now, we'll have a multi-year plan to present to the board with dollar figures. Um, so let me just show you some of the pieces here. Um, so I, we actually brought some live too. Uh, that piece, the combo desk chair in front of the parents. Are you gonna demonstrate Mr. Uh, Rich Tully? That's what I'll do. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll accept any volunteers from the board who'd like to do that. So uh, this picture demonstrates what our classrooms at middle and high school look like right now. Um, so they're either grouped in twos or fours or in rows, and it's this desk right here. So anyone wants to use this for a board meeting one night, I'll let them do that. <laughs> but imagine our secondary students using this from 8 a.m. to about 2.30 p.m. with a cafeteria and uh, play outside for 20 minutes break. Um, just another uh, version of a middle school. These are our real classrooms, okay? Uh, so that's primarily, and it's really not conducive with the HQI model for instruction where we want collaboration, flexibility, agency, uh, student advocacy. Um, so at East Shore, pardon those individuals who have taken the tour, but I thought so many of you um, weren't able to attend. I wanted to show you some of the pieces. You'll see this piece here. It's a bench. These um, rolly things. Um, the students are straddling them, they put them on the sphere part and they rock. Um, some of them sit on top, some sit on side. So this is a bank uh, that is used by students flexibly. You'll see this desk and chair is this right here. These are um, adjustable seats and desks. So you can stand to work or you can sit very easily. Think you have to get on it to do it. <laughs> <laughs> so students can choose to sit uh, throughout the day and at will uh, as they're working without great disruption get a stand break. And you can also move these around, work with a partner, work with three, four, five, six. You could be in the middle, you know, attending to the teacher. Uh, you could be off to the side. You'll see a couple pictures where these are on the side. So very 
quote unquote flexible. This is um, board members who attended. You, you heard from kids that this is probably their favorite because it gives them options, right? right. So you'll see this, I think, is being affectionately called the living room um, because this is very comfy, cozy. You have some of these adjustable chairs all around with a workspace and then some cozy, comfy, soft seating in the middle and some of those little uh, bucket seats are here around. Um, over here on the side in this classroom are some of these stand-up desks. During instruction, I think there's a piece with some kids in it. Yeah, so that is the living room being in use. This is during a time where students are working independently and collaboratively. You'll see students just spread throughout the room by choice. Uh, a lot of kids are, are, did say, I, I won't, I mean, some of the board members can even share what the ch students are saying, but they really enjoyed the, um, the choice, the flexibility, they felt more comfortable, they felt like they could learn better. Um, sitting down on soft seating, on a chair, standing up. And uh, more use of the living room. Students uh, can even collaborate along the, uh, the perimeter of the living room. That's the bench being used. That, and these, everything is on wheels, um, so it could be easily moved and reconfigured. I think um, Ms. Bartone says that she changes her room up every couple weeks. <laughs> and there is her classroom laid out. This is an ELA eighth grade class. Over at Harborside, we also have a living room, but you see this teacher just configured her room a little bit differently. This is a, uh, a station where um, students can work um, in a small group. Again, this teacher chose to bank those two um, benches together. I don't see the surfboard. I know that a couple of our board members tried that out. Mm -hmm. So it is um, it's a wobble board. It's a wobble board, right? So it's a little mini board where kids stand and they can do a wiggle. Um, so there's just enough of a curve to the board that gets you moving a little bit. And we tried it out and didn't fall. <laughs> Here's a different configuration altogether. You'll see this um, this bench in another slide can be used either flat or up and down. These tables are movable, so you have some group work here. These um, I forget what these are called. Uh, I don't know, Dr. Fagan. They're the ones that have wheels on one side, and you can easily lift and move, and they stack very easily, so you can move them out of the way. The whole desk. Um, this is a less popular. A uh, piece of furniture with the middle schoolers, they told us. Uh, but it is used. And the ones that are used are uh, first, the kids try to get to the adjustables. Um, but these are a little bit more traditional, with the exception of being uh, are movable with the two wheels. These chair, we're also very maintenance conscious as we purchase this. We want um, durable furniture that's going to last a while, but also easy to clean. And these chairs just pop right up onto the um, desk, so they're easy to clean for custodians. You see some kids using the center. So um, you'll see that this also gives us some options in more traditional seating, too. That was a concern of some people visiting, that some students may not be able to handle all this flexibility and movement. So um, some of these uh, barrel type of desks uh, can still be banked together like a traditional classroom, but more easily um, transportable. This is the, the classroom I was talking about where some of the stand-up desks are on the side, so to be a little bit less, quote-unquote, disruptive, disruptive. There's the use, some of those kids are taking those cushies and using them with um, adjustable desks. This is a different use of the out, this is the exterior of the living room, so you see how flexible it is? So you can have the living room separate from the high top and still have a semicircle of collaborative work going on here. And it appears in this classroom, the living room is off to the corner, the cushy stuff. See, again, theme, flexibility. There's a young man just curled up. So here at uh, Law, um, didn't have great uh, photos to share with you. But this is one of the, um, sort of like the booth uh, concept, very popular. We only have one at Law. 
We could probably buy a couple more and kids would love it. They bank themselves in here and they're doing sharing work, talking, listening to music, getting things done. I'm sorry for the graininess of this. This is also another seating area. It has um, a USB ports where you can plug in, charge up, um, and it's seating all around. And there's actually some divider for some privacy. This is um, two versions of the same type of um, teaching um, nook. And we have, this is very, very popular in the learning center where um, it, it's almost, it's become like a magnet at law of, for students just come around and if there's some math instruction, they're just jumping right in. So uh, every time I've been at law, there's always been a teacher or two, one either on the inside and one on the outside um, as it is staffed there at law. And students just kind of hang all over here and they have their math books out or their reading books, writing, depending on the subjects going on. Right here is a ViewSonic, so any student can project up to the ViewSonic to show their work. And that's what's happening. So students are saying, hey, this is what I got for this, some geometry, algebra kind of problem. And there's a teacher helping students and students helping students. Students are hanging, hanging. They're sitting all around this area. Uh, it's become so popular, I've seen kids pull, um, because it's mobile, um, roll other tables around. So if this, I, I think we could double this size and it would be in use. And then we have another one of these for um, the Student Support Center as well, where some instruction is occurring, uh, again with a view uh, sonic board, and we have some more flexible tables for small group instruction over at Law. So these are some early uh, sketches of what foreign potentially could look like. Colors are not selected. These are just some renderings from the um, architect, but they are looking to create sort of a, a cafe area at Foreign where students can work and uh, they're looking to start up like a Parsons Perks at Foreign um, run by students. And um, so that would be these high top tables with a little mini cafe uh, going on. You'll see some workstations here. We're likely going to put a small bank of computers, have a few stand um, desktops. Oh, here's the cafe area from a different angle. This is going to be the checkout center. We have vision glass classrooms, but it's just way too expensive. So that will likely not happen in the real world. <laughs> Foreign is envisioning two teaching areas with flex uh, furniture. This is a little bit more of a formal um, tall table with adjustable chairs such as those where a teacher could just bring in a class, do some instructing, and have access to the learning comments. And here's another teaching area. Because foreign is so large, we can put those two teaching areas in. Uh, what's not uh, on the rendering is they have a living room style area as well, where there are comfy couches and chairs and such not. So in kindergarten, we have very early the renderings. It, it, this is like the beginning of the sketch out. So we're envisioning um, in the budget, we have uh, put together a cost for this nook area here, for these different types of tables and different seating, if you see. They have like a round bouncy ball with little legs on it. Then the chairs that are literally on the floor, which is the back. Uh, we have some uh, little wobbly um, seats for kids, and then we have some traditional seating. And this is a seat that we, I don't think, picked up in the middle school, but it literally um, looks like a thumbtack with the bottom, and the bottom is uh, rounded, so kids can sit and work and wiggle. Um, so this is primarily a sketch up for kindergarten classrooms. <coughs> Here's a closer view of some of the seating that may be flexible and a little bit more uh, developmentally appropriate for five and six year olds. So that is the flex furniture dream, we think, uh, at this point in the planning. Questions about that? Mr. Pulaski. Thank you. Uh, from a logistics kind of standpoint, uh, I'm, just, I'm just wondering how, how would this work when, so it's fully flexible, you can move it around, when a student comes into the classroom uh, for their period, for instance, in the high school, 
and whatnot, will the furniture just be everywhere, or is it going to be, like, at the end of the day, someone has to put it all back to, like, standard kind of formation, and then the student walks in and says, I want that today, I'm going to go to that, or do they, will they have assigned seats? I, I remember having assigned seats. I don't well, know high school, still, probably don't. Um, like, I don't know what it, how, how does it work? At this, how, so how our middle school teachers like, have given us feedback that they had to establish some procedures and protocols <coughs> because kids will try to get there and run straight to the favorite piece of furniture, right? Um, and our, our um, challenge is to have the right amount of furniture for selection for kids, right? So uh, there have been uh, different protocols that they've put in place. They have had a sign up or they've had, all right, you know, you were at the stand up yesterday, let's get another group in here. So um, I imagine that answer is gonna be age specific. So with the little people, we might need to make sure that there's a regular rotation of who's using what. At the high school, um, you know, in, in teaching and learning commons, if you get there and the, the booth is free, that's where you're going. There isn't a sign up necessarily. Okay. And, and speaking of like the young kids like looking at this, um, what do we do in the event that every kid wants to have one of the floor chairs or they all want the, the regular chairs or they all want the bouncy ball kind of chairs? Do we have are we just going to force them to use a different type of chair, or are we going to have like backups that we could bring into the classroom? Well, we, we can't have you yeah. know 24 balls and 24 floor <laughs> seats. So, you know, we teach five and six year olds to take turns and uh, adjust and adapt, and you know, always get what you want. And so, I think there are going to be um, uh, opportunities for lessons and learning. And I I think what um, just like we're doing in the middle school. Um, we're trying to figure out what kids really um, adapt to. So the ball idea may be a terrible idea. Uh, you know, so <laughs> vision of the kindergarten. <laughs> <laughs> Bouncing around the classroom? Yeah, yeah. yeah or, or like the, the, little, the little wobbly. You said there's like a wobbly kind of thing. Yeah. Yes. I, I think our kids are going to adapt to it better than our worries. I know some of the um, comments from the kids were, you know, leaning towards the understanding help, you know, and I see this with little kids too. Certain, some kids they need, they need to be moving in order to learn. I mean, and if it's, it might be a wiggle, you know, something like this. And um, they learn, and they learn better by having that mobility. Um, and I know the kids in the middle school, that's kind of what they, you know, it helps them focus. I mean, they were, they, they gave very mature um, feedback. I think there are kids on the opposite end mm -hmm. too, though, that they need to stay still to learn. And they will be yeah. able to stay still. And, um, but the, one, the math teacher pointed to um, some of her um, uh, children with IEPs that there was concern that it might be a, an issue, but you know, she cited just generally one per, one student who just soared, start, his soared. I mean, it was the difference between his yep. performance before and after was notice, very noticeable. So um, I think it's, the intent is to have traditional seating in each classroom for those, so that kids, if that's what they want, that's what they can use. Um, and, and I know Mr., even Mr. Um, Thompson did, he was very clear that we you know we do have rules Yep. There are rules, and if, if the kids need to abide by the rules, so it's the rules have to be age appropriate. And, and he feels very strongly this is an academic learning space, this is not a hangout. Correct, everyone's yeah. here to be productive. So, and I, if you visited, you saw students were productive. Yeah, Mr. Dion, I just thought I'd add because I, um, <coughs> I was pr it was pretty remarkable in the high school. Um, I mean, both, both were very interesting, and but the high school, the students were seemed to be, and Mr. Thompson sort of backed this up, but seemed to be policing themselves. Um, you know, he he's, was very clear that they cleaned up after themselves, you know, your concern about them cleaning up. It, it struck me that they liked it so much that they wanted to take care of it. Mm -hmm. That's that's how it struck me at the high school level. Um, and then in the middle school level, I think there's enough offerings that if a child wanted a traditional sit down and be still place, there were, there were options too. Um, so I think the word flexible is, is right on with it because it does give flexibility all the way around. Um, the one question I had for you is the middle school level, 
you piloted the program, right? And at kindergarten, we're just sort of diving in head first. Is that because of what we've learned at middle school, or you just think it's such an imperative that? I think at middle school, uh, because of the age, there are many more options yeah. for that um, student. And in five and six, I think um, we want to provide a, a handful of options in that classroom. Is, uh, so I, there, we can discuss looking at a pilot instead of going whole hog in 24 classrooms. So, but we feel pretty confident that we have enough of a, a variety in there that um, there's enough furniture to wiggle around and, and still be productive, so. And a lot of the instruction in kindergarten, if I recall, is on the carpet anyways, right? There is a good, a good portion of on carpet, but hopefully not too much, because that means we're sitting still right, and receiving right. instruction. And yeah. We don't want a lot of that, right? Okay. We want engagement, activity. Sure. Okay. Any other questions on this? I just, I have a Yes. <laughs> so, as, so as someone who teaches at the college level, um, when I'm looking at these, particularly at the high school level, these learning, com uh, these learning com comments, excuse me, you know, an assumption, and I'm just making an assumption right here, is, wow, what a great idea you know, to have these because this is how they're going to learn in college, right? They're going to have to be self-learners. They're going to have to learn, <clears throat> excuse me, in an environment that's so different from the traditional classroom. And I think going to college presents such a learning curve. Um, they're hit with so many things, you know, that, that one of them that I, I see as being very overwhelming to them is, is the structures of classrooms being so different. Um, and having to become self-learners and taking responsibility for your own learning. And it looks like, you know, what I see here and what you were talking about, Dr. Kataya, um, you know, with people being able to wheel up uh, desks and tables and whatnot, um, is at least to some degree, and this is my assumption, um, that these learning commons are also in part to get students ready to go on to that next level is could you just comment on just a little bit of the philosophy and if that's true so, yes um, and that doesn't just start in high school right I, um, we I think so over structured over scaffold our young people that um, when it comes to agency and advocacy they are constantly looking to the adult so at a young age, we want them to advocate for their learning need, to know how to access tools and resources that they need for their learning so that they can produce. And in HQI model, it's called the knowledge economy, consuming and producing knowledge um, in a way that is accessible today in 21st century learning. So uh, yes, particularly at the high school, um, you're not necessarily going to have this overly schedule, uh, structured schedule and someone's going to tell you what all the homework is and when it's due and you have to know to walk into a learning commons and say alright so where in this space do I access the resources I need and resources isn't always just a, um, a thing it could also be people and very much so in adult life one of the greatest resources we have is one another to learn and produce so yes you hit the nail on the head that this also is to prepare them for adult living where it's a little less structured than high school. Thank you. I think a lot of work environments are moving more towards yes. this mm -hmm. kind of more collaboration. But I mean, I, I know for a fact that there are work uh, environments that allow for the stand-up desks and things like that, so mm -hmm. depending on an employee's desire. So, I just wanted to say um, one thing about starting at the kindergarten level. Um, <coughs> I'm far from an expert, but I've certainly done some research on this since this has been brought up. And one of the things that I um, had, had read about and heard about was that once you start with the flexible furniture at a lower level, the absorption level, is, it's not a big change. So if you start at a high school level, you know, it's harder for them to adjust to, oh, this is flexible. Yeah. And while at a younger age, they're able to absorb it all the way through. Similar to starting more language, I suppose. But the flexible furniture also has a similar effect. So I just want to add that in there. Any other comments or questions? Well, since this is a budget meeting, let's talk money a little bit. <laughs> um, this is not cheap, okay? So um, that kind of desk is a lot less expensive than this. So it, there's sticker shock 
mm -hmm. potentially here. So we will need a long-term plan. We'll, we won't be able to do this 24 each year, likely. Um, so uh, depending on the grade level, we're spending anywhere from nine to 20,000 in a classroom, if you're just gonna do it right from scratch, uh, in a traditional classroom. A more flexible classroom is ranging anywhere from 20 to 35, <coughs> depending on what you purchase. So the living room is gonna be more expensive, right? Mm -hmm. um, some of the wobble boards, we can easily put some of those in there at a less expensive, uh, and we don't have to do um, wobble everything in one classroom at one time. Um, we probably need to talk about um, how to allow access to more kids more regularly. So if we choose, potentially part of the plan could be we do all ELA classrooms in middle school first. So this way, if you're a 6th, 7th, or 8th grader, you know you have access to flexible furniture when you go to ELA classes, everyone takes ELA. As opposed to just doing all 7th and waiting till 7th grade for you to get there. So we have some decisions to make as to how do we roll this out. Just like when um, interactive whiteboards made it to the scene, super expensive, we want them everywhere. Um, decisions had to be made on how to allow access to all students. So um, because it's super expensive, we as a community, uh, blessed us by this board first, of course, needs to understand it's gonna be a financial commitment moving forward. Mr. Flosky. Thank you, just following up on that. Uh, has it been, has the concept of um, a, as furniture would need to be replaced normally, because desks don't last forever, um, of just going in and replacing the desk, replacing the old desks with the new flexible desk at that point instead of doing like a whole wave of them just going in, like if a classroom say, because I know we have that, the new system um, where you know we track everything, if we say, oh, I, all the the desks in this classroom need to be replaced. Let's replace them with the new uh, flexible seating rather than the old stuff. And that way, it's not the whole, like everything, the whole kit and caboodle and a bunch of money, but it's more targeted at a time. Is that has that option been explored? So um, I, I think we have some pretty aged furniture in the system. Mm -hmm. um, and if we start doing that, we may see that maybe um, at one time the system invested in, I'll just use in Orchard Hills. Um, earlier than over at Pumpkin, and now all, more of Orchard is being turned over and less of Pumpkin, and now we have, hey, why is Orchard getting all the new furniture? And so I think I'd rather make a decision that will do, for example, all ELA, and then take that furniture that we're taking out and go and put it where there's some really old furniture. Um, so there will still be a domino um, benefit throughout the system. So I think it's just a mixture of that concept with right. a strategic plan on that. So if I recall correctly, last year I believe we talked about your plan to have a systematic yeah. replacement, so to speak. So when you are pricing this out, like in your in your budget dollars, have you taken into account the offsetting? You know, so instead of replacing furniture for, I mean, it's X number of dollars. Sorry. Yes or no, you can say. So I mean, we haven't you, put furniture on a cycle. You have not? No. Okay. Uh, we right. put painting, okay. elementary cubbies. Okay. We're All creating right. a cycle for ViewSonics. Mm -hmm. um, the exercise mats and okay. our uh, gymnasium. Right. I so that furniture was pretty Furniture good. needs to be, though, because okay. right. if you take a look at some of our classrooms mm -hmm. there, they're kind of old. Yes. Okay. Mr. Pulowski? Thank you. One, one final thing. What's the expected lifetime of, of these desks, of these new pieces versus the old pieces? Jim is telling me 10 to 15. For the new ones? And the old ones were about the same? The old ones could last 20, 15 to 20. Right. But when you're in school, you get, you use things a lot longer than you should. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was going to say, yeah. I think I use those. <laughs> I definitely yeah. Who was a student here? Andy? Right? <laughs> yep. Uh, Nikki? We had very similar in Bridgeport. Okay, we're ready to move on, Mr. Uh, Dion. I'm sorry, I just have one last short question, I hope. Um, what do we do with the furniture that we remove from the classrooms? I, I know you said some of it might move to another school, but if it doesn't and we're done with it, what do we do with it? Is it furniture? 
Yeah, I think there, I think there's one question that, that we have to answer. Oh, okay. But, but I can tell you that um, when when we retire furniture, um, it's when it gets real old, um, <laughs> it goes into storage um, up at Eels Hill, which is not in the best shape. <laughs> um, but it goes in storage, and if we really need furniture, we'll pull out. If not, we have a disposal policy, which allows for uh, distribution to nonprofits or other educational institutions, and if not, then donate it to a charity. Okay. Do we have a lot of furniture at e Eels Hill right now? We've been trying to lead, <laughs> especially after the, uh, um, the K two three five. We yeah. did a lot of leading at that point. Okay. All right. Ready to move on? Thank you. Okay. Okay. So I, so I have question number 31. Um, about 7350 computers, uh, what's driving the approximately $100,000 increase? And in, in that one, we are adding a fourth lease. We, we currently have had uh, three, uh, three leases for all the computers in the district. Um, and to keep up with our replacement cycle for the new one-to-one -one Chromebook, we're adding a fourth lease. So that's the, that's the driver of, the, uh, of that increase. And now it'll be every year, it'll be the same cycle. Ms. Hennessy? Uh, when you say a fourth lease, are you leasing the same machines for a fourth time? Or is no. it, okay, so they're being retired because they've aged out? Correct. Okay, thank you for that. Sure. Other questions? Mr. Kowalski? So this cost would be the same. It would the same cost would be recurring every year going forward. If except except that this is the year we have we have three four year we have three yes three four year leases, and this would be the year that we wouldn't have a payment or we wouldn't have a new lease coming on. Mm -hmm. So we are putting a new lease on. So now we will have four four year leases that will continue to. Hold. So every year we would re-lease. So this this would be a recurring payment. Correct. Right? Okay. Mr. Dion. Um, can you just, it's just a logistic question, not as much budget, but um, the student is issued a Chromebook in third grade, right? That's the first, first grade that we issue it. And then that same Chromebook stays with them for four years, and then they get a new one in seventh grade? Is that how it works? I, I'm, I don't not know sure. that. I, I'm not sure what the plan is. That's, okay. That's yeah, we'll, we'll check, check it back, back to you on that. Okay, all right, thanks. Okay, number 32. Okay, number 32 is asking about the science curriculum pre-K-12 um, and if we would be making a specific investment in ensuring that we present a curriculum that um, in encourages our female students who attend Milford Public Schools to think about future um, leadership in the STEM fields. And the research, um, it was cited here in the, in the question around um, women in the workforce, in the STEM workforce, and um, you know, one of the things that's really clear in the NGSS standards is wanting to make sure that we lift uh, an aligned um, set of rigorous teaching and learning experiences for all of our students. And certainly the curriculum will be based, as we discussed last night and in the previous presentation, in that curriculum, but very recently, um, Mrs. Swanson, our instructional supervisor of student development and wellness, I'm sorry, our instructional supervisor of STEM, um, and I attended a conference, a CTE conference. I think we spoke about it actually during the night because when the science um, work was presented. There was a lot of conversation even during that event around um, what are the youngest uh, uh, students that start in their pathway. We talk about pathways typically in the high school range, but what are even our youngest students doing in the way of science that would then put these students on a track for pathways uh, to college um, study and career opportunities um, after they leave grade 12? Not just obviously, are we focusing on this in Milford <coughs> Public Schools, but throughout the state? And so while the curriculum won't slant toward our female students, we are certainly going to plan for rigorous instruction to meet the needs of all of our learners. The idea of introducing the science labs at the earliest level, I think especially with kindergarten students before boys and girls have messaging, whether it's intentional or unintentional, about um, their study and, and what they should or could do as learners. When children are really young, they're wide open to learning. So I think that will certainly help um, increase female um, interest in, in the STEM fields. 
But again, we're, we're going to encourage that level of inquiry and alignment to the standards for all students in Milford Public Schools, but we'll be keeping note on how our students progress, boys and girls equally, um, in the curriculum and through assessment. Questions on this? <clears throat> so I, I just would like to make a comment on that. Um, so I, I know that when you look and I'm making some general statements here, right? So generally, <clears throat> excuse me, when you look at curriculums, um, the curriculums that we have in our public schools, um, they don't necessarily reflect uh, the, either the genders or the, the cultures and races of the students who are sitting in those classrooms, right? Um, and when I, I think about, for example, the science curriculum, right, and we're, and we're talking about um, all of these different, what they're going to learn, right, and they're going to learn all of these wonderful things. Um, but we also know that for <clears throat> students to take this knowledge of what they are able to do and be able to say, yes, this is something that I can do and that I can achieve, and I think one of our goals as a school system is always to help each child develop their gifts and talents and become their best selves, right? So in order for them to be able to understand whether they're looking at science or history or language arts, they need to somehow see themselves reflected within the curriculum, right? And we know we've had those, those discussions take place regarding who is standing in front of their classrooms as well as what they're learning as well. So, you know, one of the things um, that we talked about last night when we were talking about investing um, in these new science labs, right, is how, let's see, we wanted to, we want to create this, a program in science that really is pioneering. Pioneering is my word, right, but we want to be a leader. And Dr. Kataya, um, this is the problem with having a journalist in the room, right? Um, with the potential to, quote, transform our elementary schools, right? So if we are going to invest in equipment that has the potential to transform our schools, um, I know personally, as someone who is going to, you know, vote for that money, I would feel so much more comfortable if I knew that the corresponding curriculum was going to be broadly um, transformative as well. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I just read an article the other day about how, you know, you ask a group of people, name some famous scientists, right? And they can name, you know, 12 different male scientists and, you know, Madame Curie is, is the only female scientist that, that mm -hmm. most people can name. And part of that has to do with exposure, right? You know, it's the same thing, you know, when you look at the kind of biographies students are reading. You know, they don't necessarily read about Latinos or Dominicans or other cultures as well. So, you know, I, this, this idea of, you know, ensuring that our, that we're, we're giving our students the whole package. I'm sure it's nothing that you haven't thought about before, but to me, if we're going to make an investment um, in the physical side, you know, I would like to feel comfortable knowing that there is also an investment in, in you know, the, the I don't know what the correct word is. Pedagogy. Intelli pedag yes, thank you. <laughs> the pedagogical side uh, as well. So I think because our, our, um, <clears throat> our work toward making sure that we have high quality instruction in every single classroom, um, pre-K through grade 12, reaching the needs of all of our learners toward that vision of the learner really does require us to think about the needs of every learner before us, boy and girl. I think starting at the earliest stage when children are in kindergarten and they, and they don't have yet preconceived notions yet of how they excel in school and what they're, um, again, the messaging around different careers that are, that are available for boys and girls, they are wide open and they realize that they have an untapped unlimited potential for achievement and they're naturally curious so I think you know the curriculum will reflect that but beyond the curriculum and what's written the experiences that we present to our youngest learners when the curriculum is implemented will um, provide greater opportunities for that because it's not just the curriculum that's written right it's the implementation and how it's how we engage our learners in the classroom so again starting with a, with a vision of the learner that starts with pre-k 
um, presenting some of these ideas in the very beginning of student study in Milford Public Schools certainly will facilitate getting to what you're talking about. By the time students are in high school, grade 11 and 12, they have some pretty, um, they're not always for sure as we, we know, right, what they want to do in college. It's why uh, sometimes students when they go on think, I don't know, and they haven't, right, we all see that happen too. But when students are, when students are younger, they really um, know that they, they just follow what they're naturally curious and interested about. Can I add on to that? Mm -hmm. um, so I've talked to Dr. Nobley about, um, <coughs> and Mr. Smith, about why don't we have a science center in kindergarten where, um, you know, we have this kitchen and we have this building block center. Because um, I want every kid to think that they could be a scientist. And I think the implementation of this curriculum at a very young age is going to be really critical for us. And I, I think it does get to pedagogy and professional learning of teachers too, right? Because I think we fall into, educators have been in, in a while, into this mode of um, this is the structure of schooling. And I do and, uh, agree with you that we're going to have to break some of that mental model, uh, particularly around careers in the sciences. So I think we have to be intentional in our implementation guide. So curriculum is one piece that will be a public consumption piece. But behind that, our supervisors will create implementation guides that I think will have to be very purposeful and strategic around, so how do you roll out this concept that anybody can be a scientist? And there are careers um, at a very young age. So in our work with our administrators, we believe elementary is this um, beautiful place to um, maintain and uh, foster creativity and inquiry, like really keep curiosity high and, and active. And then when you're getting to 6 through 12, uh, really establishing career paths there for all of our students to start exploring here so that at the end of 12th grade, if you want to go straight into a career, you are ready. You, you can go and, and be employable or you can go on into college in all areas. So I don't know if that gets to your and the being intentional and purposeful. We see that happening at a very young age particularly through the sciences. And pathways have typically been explored for students when they're in high school. So part of this articulate, it's too late. Part of that continuum has to be explored, not only middle school, but even prior to right. that. And sometimes it, having this natural inquiry and opportunity to explore helps children figure out what they don't want to do also. Mm -hmm. That's, an, that's another absolutely. Really I'm absolutely, but they also need models, right? They yeah, also need to be educated about the people who did what they might want to do before them. Ms. Hennessy, um, it's not necessarily a budget question, but more like pedagogy. Um, I don't know if it's included in HQI professional development or separate professional development, but um, has local public schools done anything with culture and responsive teaching? Because that would address the point that. Um, that's something that's brought up and also you know it's just like as simple as you know it's like a science lab having posters of famous women scientists and mm -hmm. have, you know you know I mean it's that's just one piece of it but. so it's a great question but we yeah. really need to keep this discussion based on what is in our budget our budget work okay so maybe that's okay. something that we can explore right. at, mm -hmm. at a later okay. date so are there any other questions on the site on the science curriculum <coughs> that's reflected in this question 32. Okay, Mr. Richitelli, yep. next one. 33, or, that's who's me. Who's on 33, you? Uh, this uh, question relates to um, programming in the budget um, being targeted more than for students who are college bound or more than just improving standardized test scores uh, and having options for students who uh, will go straight into the careers. Um, so, uh, Actually, the proposed budget, uh, I believe, tries to break the trend on uh, focusing on standardized test scores. When I first arrived in district, we immediately stopped um, a, a lot of the NWA testing uh, that had started with our five-year-olds. Um, and I don't know, outside of the once a year presentation that we give this board, we don't do a lot of presenting on test scores. Uh, I believe if we focus on the real work of improving teaching and learning, the scores will take care of themselves. Um, an overemphasis on looking at numbers do not improve numbers. But realistically, our public consumes numbers as one indicator of success. So we can't completely ignore it. And hence, that was my 
purpose in using it in the presentation that uh, we can't ignore the number. It's been pretty flat. Uh, so by focusing on the vision to learner, high quality instruction, and providing quality programming for our kids, I believe that that number will start to take care of itself. Uh, as far as having more career um, focused options, uh, we have the career pathway starting in high school. You've heard us talk that we have a desire to drop that down in sixth grade. We're revisiting the middle school schedule over the next two years. We want more electives, more options for kids to explore what they may or may not like. Uh, we are going to do some work in the manufacturing area. In fact, I'd like to bring a certifiable program to our high school so kids could walk out of our high schools being certified in manufacturing. Nice. Um, you know, we have some local area districts that are already doing that. We want to go and learn from them. And Ms. Swanson is spending a, um, I forget what I've called it, but um, they're taking a tour. They're going on uh, adult field trips, I think is what we're calling them. <laughs> we're sending our tech ed teachers out uh, to some progressive school districts to take a look at what that curriculum looks like. And what you can anticipate in the future is a revamp of our tech ed curriculum but more importantly, what those opportunities look like in our middle schools, starting in our middle schools. So um, while it may not be prominent in this, uh, please know that there's a lot of planning behind the scenes around some of those pieces um, that would be more, uh, I guess, explicitly career focused. Mr. Pulaski. Thank you. Um, this has been something that I, I've been paying particular attention to, and while I didn't ask this question, um, I just want to point out within our budget, we do also have like part, parts of uh, the uh, upgrades include uh, coding robots, green screens, video production equipment, uh, cameras and camcorders, STEM robotics kits. Those and the aren't automated scanners, and, uh, right? and automated diagnostic scanners. Yeah. Those aren't necessarily college uh, mm -hmm. focused mm -hmm. items. Those, I mean, coding robots. You could take a six month course and be a coder, so you don't need to, to go to college for that. And those are career items. So I, I think the budget does do about, does balance both the uh, needs. And we'll try to do more of that explicitly, yeah. but we just need some time to, to plan and um, put some of those pieces in place. Mr. DeYoung? Um, the 6422, the testing line item, um, the description of it uh, in the supporting narrative generally is for PSATs, advanced placement, and SATs. Is that the only thing that's covered under that line item? Or do we do, like, does SBAC cost us any money to, to no. administer? Or do we have any other standardized testing that we give our kids? We don't, you know, just pay for the goals or PSAT, mm -hmm. we've expanded that. Remember, we proved right. that last year. We pay for some of the AP testing, uh, for partial AP testing for kids. SAT school day. SAT school day. Not, not that's coming right to. So it's not really a lot that, as a district, we require, right? I mean, I know PSAT is a is something that we added. But as far as the SAT is something that the state uses for their assessments, correct? For 11th graders now, yeah. For 11th graders. But we're not, we're paying for that for just 11th grade, or are we paying that, paying for that for other, other we're grades? We're paying for PSAT. But not SATs. SAT is a state, state assessment. assessment. And they pay for it. The state pays for it? OK. So um, there are other assessments in the system, though. That's that that, OK, that's what I was regular. asking. So about. you're. Yeah. Like your child is given a, a reading benchmark assessment. Okay. And so that's a kit we buy, we train teachers, it's reusable material, so you're not seeing, unless we have replacement. Um, but those are coming out of different line items. And, and those aren't standardized though, right? Those are done like one-on-one -on -one or in groups with kids? Well, they have a standardized measure of uh, benchmarking. But okay. It's, it's not the high stakes testing. Yeah, that's right. That's probably a better phrase. Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah. Let's not sit down and fill up bubbles for answers, right? Not at the elementary. Yeah. And we removed NWA, which was electronic version of bubbling. Right. OK. All right. Thank you. Other questions? OK. Move on. 32. Uh, this refers to, are there any 23 student class sizes that, oh, sorry, 34. Did I say 22? <laughs> 32. 32. 32. Sorry. It's OK. Pardon me. Number 34. 
Is a 23 student class size something that no Milford school has right now or just certain ones? Can, it, can you explain how the proposed smaller class size is going to impact staffing levels at each? And then overall. So I, I, I hope we answered this to the intent. Uh, it was a little fuzzy at the beginning. So what is proposed is used to determine the number of classroom teachers. So if there are 44 students, this is the example in the text, in a grade level, there will be two sections of 22 students. Because the guideline is 23, it hasn't exceeded the 23. So if there are 44 divided by two teachers, there's 22 kids in that room. But if there are 48 students in a grade, then there will be three sections of 16 students if it's in grades three through five. Because if you only put two teachers there, it would be 24 students exceeding the 23 guideline. So the question are, is there any 23? Yeah, there, there are some 23, there are some 16. It just depends on the number of students in that grade. And then you take the number of the guideline and divide it into that number. And that determines the number of sections. So if you look at page Roman numeral 14 in the executive summary, summary for enrollment, The net increase in elementary class FTEs is 1.0 across the eight elementary schools based on the current projections. We went over this yesterday. We revisit enrollment frequently and later in May, June, based on an update on these numbers, um, we will more definitively determine what number FTEs we need. But right now we're projecting an increase of 1.0. I don't know if that answers that question. Does that answer the question? Yes, thank you. Mr. DeYoung? So, reducing it to 23 this year does increase a 1 FT, FTE, but next year you could potentially lose an FTE depending on the numbers, or you could potentially add an FTE. Yep. So, it's, it, it's not like the reduction in the number is specifically requiring the FTE, right? It, oh, this year it is, yeah. Well, we would have realized the savings of 3.0 FTEs had we not done that. Oh, okay. All right. Okay, fair enough. Thank you. Yeah, we, we did talk about that yesterday. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, because based on the, the current numbers, say if you had 50 in a grade level, that would only be two classrooms right now. But next year, if we were, if we lowered it to 23, that would be three classrooms. Yeah, I guess I guess what I was trying to get at, maybe not artfully enough, but is that reducing the, the classroom size um, over time doesn't necessarily mean you add or subtract FTEs. Next year it does, but the year after that it could be different. That ebb and flow occurs no matter what the number is. Right, right. right. Okay, that's what, always, to, that's, that's what I was trying to That's what I was trying to say. It's always a, I don't know, a tipping point where right. you, know, you, have, you go, and that's why there's sometimes a, such a difference between right. um, you know, when you add the section and the number of kids in that class. Right. And that's, you can't do anything about that. It's just, right. Yeah, that, that was my yeah. point, is that yeah. whether we have it at 23 or 25, that's fluctuation still going to happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any other questions on this? Okay. Thank you. Okay, number 35. Um, the question is, um, what is the total special education increase in this year's budget, both in terms of dollars and percentage? and also include pupil services. So I've, I've given you a little chart there. Um, in 1920, um, our expenditures for special education were 20,613, uh, which represented 20.68% of the entire budget. In uh, 2021, in this budget, uh, that goes up to 20, a little over 21 million, uh, which represents 21.34% of the budget an increase of 401,000, uh, which is an increase over last year of 1.95% for special education spending. Um, same thing for pupil services. Um, you, you have the numbers there in, in 1920. Uh, we spent 1,483. And uh, in 2021, in this budget, we're asking for 1.496, difference of 13,000, or a little less than 1%. Um, of the uh, of over last year, and it represents around one point one and a half percent of the entire budget. Any questions on that? 
Mr. Pulowski? Thank you. Just want a point of uh, clarification. That, that figure is um, including, that is not including, um, after the excess cost reimbursement that we get from the state? No, no, that's cost. Okay. That's Thank you. direct cost. Okay. Just want to be sure. Thank you. Other questions? Okay, we can move on. Okay, in 36, um, what is the dollar amount being used in the excess cost reimbursement uh, to offset the district special ed costs? And we factored in into this budget $405,000, um, which, which, which should offset. Uh, there's so many moving parts with regard to special education. And the fact that we're budgeting now for services that will be delivered 16, 18 months from now, it's very difficult. Um, but we've been very successful in staying ahead and uh, budgeting properly so that we're not getting stuck with special education services and, and the, uh, any increase or any uh, overages that we do have are covered by the excess cost grant. What was the amount? Sorry. That's okay, Mr. Sorry. Twist. sorry. Um, what was the amount that was budgeted this year in terms of excess cost? I'm not sure that I understand the same same amount. This year you're saying for next year you're factoring in four four hundred and five thousand dollars. What amount was for the nineteen twenty budget? Well, in terms of excess cost. We, we could get that for you, but Okay. I'm not sure maybe maybe if you could fill me in on Well, I'm trying to say longitudinally where because um, I'm looking at this as at the per pupil cost is twenty two thousand and change. Four and a half times that is going to be a larger amount of money to get to a point where it even triggers the excess cost grant. So I'm looking at this in terms of excess cost is going to continually go down because the as your per pupil costs go up and the, if the four and a half times per pupil cost stays the same, you're going to have that fluctuation of, okay, what's going to trigger finally four and a half times the per pupil cost before you can even expect getting any money back from uh, the excess cost grant. So I'm just trying to see if what the trend line has been in Milford in terms of what has been um, traditionally the amount of money that you're getting back from the excess cost grant to any Oh, yeah. that's different. That's different from what, what we're getting back um, as to what we're offsetting. Um, so in, in the frequently asked questions, there is, we do give that figure for the previous two years, I believe. Because we talked about this last night, yesterday, <coughs> last night as well, in terms of the dollar amount that the, the grant goes to the city, and right. we asked for the city to turn it over to us to the extent that we need it. And last year there was um, a fair amount that was left with the city. So, so on, on frequently asked Sorry. question number twelve, is that page A two? Yes, A2, I'm sorry. Yeah. How much funding does the state provide for special education compared to the costs? Um, and then I, I've given you the, <clears throat> the figure for 1819. Uh, we got back $1,120,000. I, I could give you that. I could give you a listing for the past you know, several years of how much money was given. Uh, actually okay, so if you got $1,120,000 last year, and we're proposing next year that you're going to get $401,000? That's what I'm trying to figure. No, I'm not, no, 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 I'm sorry. I, I, I misunderstood the question. The 405000 is mm -hmm. the factor that we, we reduce our budget. Mrs. Swift puts together the right, best right. estimate. And then I, we I, get, I get that, that part of it. What I'm trying yeah. to figure out is where were you this year and how much money did you use to offset special ed? Are, you know, when you're making a budget and you're saying, okay, I need a million, I'm going to get the only way I can do this. You, get, you need a million dollars for special education. I'm going to get back $200,000. I'm anticipating getting back $200,000. So that when you come to the budget meeting, do you offset your $1 million by the $200,000 and then propose the budget at being $800,000 because you're looking at that net reduction of $200,000, despite the fact that it goes to the town? Right, and, and, and there have been years where we ask for the entire amount back, and there are some years where the city recognizes revenue because of it. 
So it's it's it, there's a there's a huge fluctuation. This is definitely. No, I, I, no, I, I, I honestly, I, I honestly, yeah. truly do understand that there's a large fluctuation. Yeah. I'm just trying to figure out where Milford is. I mean, I I. I do budgets. I get that. I'm just trying to figure where is Milford in terms of what are you using to offset the cost of special ed? How much from year to year? That's really all I, all I wanted to know. I have to, I have to think about the question and how to okay. answer it. Mm -hmm. Can you perhaps give us a response in the Friday update? I'll try. Okay. Yes. Yeah, let's go back to the office and maybe <coughs> we may need to just yeah, clarify absolutely. some of the question with you tomorrow absolutely. if that's all right. Sure. All right. We've gone to 37. Can we have a line by line specific breakdown of the ed supplies and other ed supplies and what are the administrative priorities? So, on room and rule 8 and then pages 35 through 41, there is um, a breakdown of these accounts by category, and then 35 to 41 has some examples of what these accounts uh, include. Uh, as far as administrative uh, priorities, uh, I would say that those are directly related to the system improvements uh, as listed in the superintendent's letter. And those examples, those supplies, whether they're instructional or non-instructional, would be related to the science labs, world language, technology, purpose of play, HQI, the SEL work, makerspace, fitness, climbing wall, music instruments. Those are all included in those accounts. So those would be the priorities as related to the system improvements. Questions? Okay, we can move on to 38. So this is uh, regarding the new classrooms um, and why are we budgeting for furniture and supplies if we have other classrooms closing. So while there are other classrooms closing, um, the supply and materials available through redistribution will go to some of the classes that were collapsing and some that were increasing. So even though there's only increase of one, we're still closing like a second grade and it's going to third. So that would be the swap. So sec that second grade class would go to the third grade class, even if it's across town. Um, we need to do a better job, and with our new instructional um, supervisor team and Dr. Fedigan, we're starting a new system this year that inventories a full classroom before it gets collapsed. Uh, so some of the materials in classrooms that have been collapsed in the past have just been then redistributed throughout the school. So if JFK has a third grade that closes, then materials go to second, fourth, fifth grade teachers, wherever it's appropriate. So rather than packing up that whole room and saying, OK, we'll wait for third grade to open up another year, it's been trickled out to other rooms. This year, we're creating a system that hopefully will protect those resources and be available. But we also don't want to create a system where we have materials sitting around in Simon Lake not being used, waiting for a class to open. So there's a little bit of give and take there. So based on our analysis of up and down the enrollment chart, we believe we have to fund um, potentially another classroom. And then this year we had to dip in um, to some other supplies because we unexpectedly opened a kindergarten room. Um, so there's always that possibility that our enrollment is just that, a projection. So if we have to open additional classes, this also helps us fund the opening of another classroom. Okay, thank you. Any questions on this? Okay. 39. Um, so while the superintendent's letter reads pre-K through K, um, the fifth bullet on the first page of the Q&A that you received last night only says pre-K. So the first page of the question should read pre-K-K, -K, okay? And um, the flex furniture is a separate expense from the play-based learning. So the play-based learning, that, those numbers include the addition of two um, learning centers in each one of our kindergarten rooms. Based on the feedback we'll get from the analysis by the um, external review, but also, um, we want to put in some more contemporary type of centers in addition to blocks and kitchen. So that's baked into pre-K, K play-based learning. And then the flex furniture is just that what I showed you, separate. But very much related, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Questions on this? OK. That concludes the formal questions that have been submitted. Um, 
anybody else have any anything you need to clarify based on what we've already discussed? No. Okay. Um, so we do have public comment on the agenda tonight. Um, do either of our guests wish to speak to the board tonight? <laughs> no? <laughs> Neither one? I can make, I'll make one comment. Okay, so let me just read the public comment. Yes. Do it the right way. Um, speakers may offer objective comments about school operations and programs. The board encourages speakers not to express personal complaints or def defamatory comments about the Milford Board of Education personnel or any person associated with Milford Public Schools. Security issues and matters relating to negotiations and grievances will not be permitted. Consistent with the principles of the Federal Education Rights Privacy Act, discussion of students is prohibited absent parental waiver. Public comment is limited to agenda items only. We ask that you state your name and address for the record and limit your comments to three minutes. And just a side note, public comment does not allow for two-way conversation between the board and the participants. Uh, we thank you for your expressing your thoughts and opinions, and all comments will be taken into consideration. Thank you. The floor is yours. Awesome. Thank you. I'm um, Liz Shipman, Six Dog Replace. I'm a parent at um, JK Elementary, and thank you to everybody for um, letting us sit in on this process. It's been a, a really interesting week. I learned a lot. Um, further to my um, mission to reduce the class size, especially at, at JFK, we looked at some of the numbers that um, Dr. Kachire included on that, the enrollment. So we know that to, uh, if, you, if we lowered the class size, it would add two teachers in Meadowside and two teachers at JFK in the upper grades. Um, and right now, when we looked at the current enrollment, which, is, which I think was from October, which doesn't, I think, since then someone else came into JFK's third grade. Um, JFK school has the largest third grade class out of all of the schools. We have 26 in one class and 25 in the other. The other classes are around max 23, 18, 19, 20. So if you think six more kids and a class in JFK versus a class at Orchard Hills, for example. We also have the, um, largest fourth grade class at 24 compared to the other schools in um, Milford. We noticed, I don't know if the numbers are right, but we noticed there's um, 50 in the fourth grade at Meadowside and they got three sections and we have 50 in our third grade um, at JFK and we only got two teachers. So, so we're seeing some disparity there in, um, they were, their class size is 16 and ours is up to 25. Um, we have a small class bubble, so our fifth grade is very small. They're only at 40, so we don't have we don't have hold the honor of largest class for our fifth grade. Um, that goes to Pumpkin, um, but their class size is the only other max class size at 24. So it's just some, something to add. This is why we're passionate about it. 25, 26 kids, or 25 kids is too many in a classroom. Teachers can't be effective, and our students are um, are having a hard time learning. So um, thank you for allowing me to give this comment. Thank you very much. You. Would anybody else care to um, address the board for public comment? Yes? Um, can I stand up? I don't yes, you may. Okay. That's what it's there for. I'm used to podiums here. I only like it against you. Um, so uh, my name is Kara Flannery, and I live at 41 North Street in Milford. And I wanted to come and speak to the uh, tonight in support of the superintendent's proposed budget. And there's a lot in this budget that I'm excited about, but I am also particularly excited about lowering class sizes in third through fifth grade. And I just wanted to offer my voice as uh, I'm not a JFK parent. Um, but, um, <laughs> my son was at Orange Avenue last year, and we were really lucky. Our grades were, our uh, class sizes, the, the grade size was over 50, so we had to break it down into three classes. Our class sizes were 17 to 20 max very manageable and what I noticed is that third through fifth grade you you are asking these children to deal with much more challenging material they have to adapt to much more challenging curriculum critical thinking and they're also doing it at a time when the social emotional issues are really coming into play behavioral issues are coming into play so to think that we can take our class sizes <coughs> sorry, to think that we can take our class sizes from second to third grade and jump them 25 percent from 20 to 25 it's it's misguided at best and it's irresponsible at worst i think that we really deserve to keep that that um to maintain a reasonable class size k to five that to, to make this incredible leap grade three it just doesn't make any sense to me as a parent and um, this is a school that, you know, I'm just offering this as a parent who is in your schools today, the way children are today, not the school that I grew up in or a school that I may have worked in 20 years ago. These are schools today that um, 
These are some of the challenges that we face, and it's really important to keep our class sizes at in, in a way that allows teachers to give that individual instruction when it's needed, and believe me, it is needed on a daily basis. Um, children, uh, teachers have to do that check-in to see how a student is doing. So um, I feel passionate about this as well, even though my child is not affected in the district. I think that it's really important for us to pay attention. Um, also, um, I'm also really excited to see those science labs, and I wanted to say thank you, Dr. Pattaya, for your vision in that regard. I think it's one of the reasons why um, we, when parents were talking to consultants that were exploring the possibilities and what we wanted out of a superintendent, we were asking for some vision, and this really shows some vision, to actually take a science lab and put it in an elementary school. Children are by nature inquisitive, they're curious. I remember my son asking for a chemistry set in second grade. There isn't much that the schools are doing with science in the second grade right now. They do more with that curriculum in the fourth grade, but um, this allows them this room for exploration, room for experimentation, which um, it's, it's kind of a win-win situation because um, I think that it, 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 not a, it, it ignites their curiosity in so many different ways. I also want to say that when we do introduce science curriculum in the fourth grade, um, I was a room parent in the fourth grade, and it's usually the room parent that's called upon to help with the science experiments in the classrooms, and believe me, it gets very chaotic. You walk in and you say, okay, what are we doing today? You're handed this kit, you try to break it down with a student, you try to work with them on the science experiment, and you know you start to sit and you wonder, are they, what, what are we really getting out of this? Are we really able to um, do that Socratic questioning, or are we really you know, helping them get the most out of this experiment? So I think a lab would really be beneficial. It would be a place where parents, I'm sorry, the teachers could bring the students to, the experiments are set up, you have a science teacher who knows how to do the experiment, I just think it's also a win-win situation, so thank you for that. Um, and, um, and again, one more thing, you know, thank you for presenting a budget that moves Milford forward. I think that um, we've just been trying to, tread, we're just, we've just been trying to defend our schools for so long that uh, we really haven't had an opportunity to have this kind of vision. I know it's not the number that we have, uh, that a lot of people are happy about right now, but it's a number that I would support as a taxpayer. It's a number I would support as a parent. So um, thank you for uh, taking us to that level. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wish to address the board? Okay, seeing none, public comment will be ended. Um, so before we adjourn, I just wanted to uh, remind the board that um, we uh, have another meeting scheduled on Wednesday. The, the hope is that board members will kind of go home and review the materials and digest all we've talked about. Um, if there's any, anything that needs to be cleared up, um, you know, we, I'd appreciate a heads up as sooner than later so that we can um, inform administration of that. And um, when we come in, traditionally, we come in on the last day, we take a few minutes to clear up any final details, if there are any, um, and then we would hope to vote on Wednesday. Um, I, it would seem to me that unless there's some big major issue that comes up, um, there's, I don't see any reason why we sh won't be able to vote on Wednesday. So I hope you'll come prepared for that. Um, and again, you know, if you have any, anything you need clarification on, let me know. Um, as soon as possible. Remembering that Monday is a, a holiday and central office is closed, so um, that day is, is waste, not wasted, but the day is gone. So, um, did you have anything you wanted to add, Dr. Kutaya? Uh, I am thankful for the board um, for doing um, your due diligence and reading through the budget um, very carefully. I always appreciate the questions that are asked. Um, I always want to push full relationship where you're causing us to think reflect on uh, our thinking and, and planning so uh, I, am, I am appreciative for this dialogue it's probably the most important um, part of the work what we can do together and considering the resources that support our staff and students so I want to thank you for your careful consideration uh, I know this is a big big responsibility um, and I've uh, we have proposed to you big plans for next year so uh, if there are any other details, um, getting questions from you sooner rather than later would be preferred. Um, so I know it's been a lot over the last two nights. So thank you to each one of you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Fowler. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion carries unanimously. And uh, we will meet again on Wednesday at 7. Unless there's a big storm, <laughs> which there won't be. Yeah, just